Is sex binary? That is, do human beings fit into one of two broad categories of sex, male and female? It's a beautiful morning here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're here on the campus of uh, MIT, and we're here in the morning of the uh, great debate that's sponsored by the MIT Free Speech Alliance, the Students for Open Inquiry, and the Adam Smith Society. And I'm Scott Turner. I'm Director of Science Programs of the National Association of Scholars, who's also a co-sponsor of this uh, debate and is sponsoring this webinar series. Uh, this is the fourth of uh, the great debates that the MIT Free Speech Alliance has put on. Uh, past great debates have included uh, the consideration of the place of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in the university, uh, and the challenges of technology, of, of, of artificial intelligence in both business and education. This year's great debate uh, centers on the proposition, resolved that sex is biological and binary, and the gender identity is no substitute for sex in social policy. So the question before us today, is sex binary? With us today are the members of the team defending the yay response to the proposition that indeed sex is binary. Alex Byrne is professor of philosophy here at MIT. His principal interests are the philosophy of mind, epistemology, and lately the philosophy of sex and gender. He's the author of several books, the most recent and most relevant to today's discussion being The Trouble with Gender, Sex Facts, Gender Fictions, and it was published this year by Polity Press. Joining him on the yay side is Holly Lawford-Smith. She's professor of political philosophy at the University of Melbourne in Australia. She's long been the target of criticism for her positions on transgenderism. She's all over the internet. You'll have no trouble finding her there. And it includes her own YouTube channel and her own website. And of course, being a professor, she's a prolific writer. For today's debate, perhaps the most relevant is her book, Gender Critical Feminism. It was published in 2022 by Oxford University Press. And also, more recently, uh, Sex Matters, uh, Essays in Gender Critical Philosophy. So, Alex and Holly, welcome to our webinar today. We're really glad to have you here. So. Thanks for having us, Scott. All right, so uh, let's just start off with a question. Um, so uh, when we talk about sex, we're really talking about several things. Uh, of course, we have gametic sex, uh, that is sperm and ova. There's genetic sex, uh, which happens, of course, when the two combine together into a new individual. And uh, at least in humans and most mammals, this is strongly differentiated, uh, uh, determined by strongly differentiated sex chromosomes. But of course, following that, there's a whole developmental process where sex is, uh, sex is uh, uh, produced. Uh, the growing organism differentiates into male and female forms. And in humans, of course, this can span several years, as any of us who, uh, who uh, have any encounters with children uh, know. And then there's what we might call perceptual sex, the body image, the sex that one perceives oneself to be. And especially when developmental and perceptual sex come in, there really is every reason to think that sex might not be binary after all. So why is sex? A binary. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, so first of all, um, obviously the topic is not uh, is not sexual reproduction, but the two great reproductive classes, male and female. And one point that we're going to make in the debate later is that the claim that sex is binary is often understood in two different ways, which leads to people talking past each other. Um, so one straightforward um, way it's understood is to mean that uh, there are only two sexes, or exactly two sexes, male and female. There aren't three or more, and there aren't one or zero. Um, but another thing that sex is binary is sometimes taken to mean is not just that there are uh, two sexes, but that absolutely every human either fits into one sex box or the other, and no human fits into fits into both. So that's, and I can tell you in advance what now I've disambiguated the slogan "sex is binary." I can tell you what our official position is. 
So on the first disambiguation, the number of sexes, our view is yes, there are indeed only two sexes. And on the second disambiguation, uh, namely the claim that every single human fits into exactly one sex box or another, um, our view is somewhat nuanced. It's that there are no clear exceptions to this, to this rule. There are certainly some cases that you can have a reasonable debate about, but there are no clear counterexamples, let me put it that way, to the claim that every human is either male or female and no one is, no one is both. You, you were raising some other issues um, about um, different, different kinds of sex or layers of sex that people sometimes distinguish. People, I mean, this actually goes back to the psychologist John Money in the 1950s, who distinguished um, seven layers of sex, including uh, genital morphologic sex, um, chromosomal sex, and, and so on. We can have a we can have a chat about that if you like. I think that's a very confusing way of talking because it makes it sound as if there's no single thing, uh, the male sex rather, there's uh, chromosomal maleness and genital morphologic maleness and so on, uh, which I think is just the wrong way of, of looking at it. And then there's a, just to finish, there's a separate issue entirely about the relation, if any, between the claim that sex is binary and the social slash political claim that um, sex is, sorry, that gender identity is no substitute for sex in social policy. Okay, so uh, there is this kind of uh, fluid identity and you drew a distinction between gender and sex and, uh, and, and so uh, this comes back to the whole issue of gender critical feminism and, and so uh, Holly, why should sex be binary given these kinds of variations of, uh, of uh, perceived sex and morphological sex and those kinds of things? I mean, I guess what's been very important to feminists since at least the second wave is to make a distinction between the sort of material reality of the person and then what society and culture has done to the person or shaped the person into what sorts of norms and expectations it's set up, how we raise boys and girls differently. That doesn't get directly to exactly what sex has to be scientifically, mm -hmm. um, but it tells us that whatever that thing is, it's important to this distinction that feminists want to make between the female as she really is or could be under different social arrangements and the way that she has kind of been shaped to be in our culture and given our sort of legacy of patriarchal societies in the past. That's the really important thing, I think, from the feminist point of view. And that's the thing that gender critical feminists are trying to reclaim. So that distinction has been lost with third and post, I don't know what way, I think people disagree about this, but that sort of distinction has been lost with people now talking about sex as well being socially constructed as the second wave has thought gender was. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of mess now in shifting from thinking of gender as something external that is done to people, and particularly we care, we care about female people, mm -hmm. to now thinking that it's a sort of internal sense of oneself, which I think gets close to your mentioning of perceptual sex, right? The way that a person feels. So these are, there are important shifts in the way that people have been thinking about sex and gender um, that gender critical feminism is coming in and really pushing back against and mm -hmm. wanting to go back to some earlier ideas. Yeah, that there is in fact a distinction between men and women and yes. just because someone calls oneself a woman that doesn't make the person a woman. Exactly, right? yeah. but there's still room there of course, like the scientists could have the argument about exactly the best way to classify certain um, differences of sexual development mm -hmm. and exactly what's the most theoretically fruitful sex distinction or whether we, you know, early in our discussions we were sort of, should we use a distinction that crosses the animal kingdom or should we use a human specific distinction that which is the most useful for us to make our political point now. So we've, we have those discussions and to some, in some, to some extent they can happen independently of this political point that whatever that natural distinction is, there's also all this other stuff, culture, learning, history, 
expectations and those two things are separate and we should be able to talk about them separately yeah yeah the whole biological dimension of it i mean i'm 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 not embedded in this whole controversy, you know. I'm a biologist, and but I have seen arguments that oh well, you know that uh, uh, you know you you have animals, uh, fish or amphibians or whatever that can actually change their sex during their lifetime. And uh, okay, I mean that's an interesting th in interesting thing. I'm glad to see it's out there in the public discourse. But but does it really have any relevance to the debate, the political debate at hand right now? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so this is where the distinction, strong distinction between male and female starts to come in because we're not fish after all, we're, we're human beings and somehow our discussions uh, uh, should be grounded somehow in biological reality. You know, that, uh, that certainly uh, uh, when you talk about the biology of sex, it's a, it's a vast subject, you know, it includes all those different dimensions of sex that we're talking about, but nevertheless we still are grounded in biological reality. We are a species that has certain characteristics and sex differentiation and uh, uh, those kinds of things. But even then, uh, Alex, you mentioned several times in, in uh, Trouble with Gender is that there are identifiable syndromes, uh, 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 chromosomal abnormalities, uh, 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 differences in sensitivity to testosterone or the ability to secrete testosterone. And so even when you're talking about morphological sex, there's some blurriness there, isn't there? So. Oh yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, can I just say a couple of things yes. since you, you, brought up, uh, you brought up sex changing f fish and of course the, the clownfish is mm -hmm. the, the post animal <laughs> uh, for this kind of thing. And on, so I, I want to make two, two points this whole debate about, oh sorry, the, the, the fact that animals like clownfish are brought into the debate, it's just completely bizarre. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand, um, the fact that they are brought into to the debate shows that what is, what is at issue is nothing human specific. It's not like male is confined to humans or something. Um, it's maleness as it's found across, or maleness or femaleness as they're found across the, the animal and indeed plant, plant kingdoms. So that's the, uh, the first point. And then the, the second point is that if, of course, it is true that some animals change sex, uh, like clownfish, they all start life as male, um, and then some of them change, uh, change to female when the, when the dominant female uh, dies and of course some animals are both sexes at once mm -hmm. um, like snails hermaphrodites uh, true hermaphrodites you have both male and female in the same uh, in the same organism and also some organisms are sexless they don't have they don't have a sex at all um, okay well that's great but what is the relevance of that supposed to be? Yes. Uh, obviously, no biologist would say, well, look, this species of fish changes sex, therefore dogs can change sex. Mm -hmm. No biologist mm -hmm. would ever argue that way yeah. or, or say, well, snails are hermaphrodites, therefore cats are hermaphrodites. Uh, so th there's clearly no relevance to the human case, and the human case is the one that we're interested in. So the whole debate has this completely surreal air about it. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting from, uh, from a sort of academic point of view, or certainly interesting if you're, a, if you're a biologist, but just what the relevance is to the case at hand is a complete mystery. Yeah. Can I interrupt and say, yeah. because this piece just came out in Colette that um, you, know, oh, you know about, right. where they went through debunking, I think it was 18 animals alleged to change sex or somehow be genderqueer, and they went through Tranimals. debunking. Yeah, but yeah, one of the one, great, the great Emma Hilton. Exactly, one of the animals, and you probably remember which, I don't, um, the claim was that the males are refugees from intra male violence and so they disguise themselves as females to hide and I actually thought that's a interesting the biologists might want to make reference to that in talking about transsexuals for example right they might say somewhere out there in in the biological world and in evolutionary history there has been this interesting adaptation where some males disguise themselves as female to escape violence or whatever to me that really stood out as like something the trans activists could grab onto 
Of course, it's not proof that because the clownfish changes sex, humans can change sex, but it is something in the evolutionary theory right. that could be helpful to them. I, I just wondered if you noticed yeah. that and what you thought about that. I, no, I can't. I didn't actually read. I did read Emma's um, uh, thread on X, but I, didn't, I haven't read, the read, read the article. Yeah, I can't remember. I mean, of course, there's, there's also another ca- kind of case where the male disguises himself as a female, the sneaky, the sneaky fucker, you can, you can <laughs> but, cut that out. But still a um, male, though, yeah. Uh, yes, so, yes. so he can, you know, grab a mating yeah. without, um, without other males yeah. noticing. And yeah, there might be some loose parallel here with um, uh, third genders in other cultures, like yes. the Fafafine mm-hmm. in Samoa. Um, I mean, that's really the Samoan culture's way of dealing with their effeminate gay men yeah. Yeah. to make them live in the manner of a woman. Yeah. You mean that's a sort of parallel of the males disguising as females to mate with females? No, I didn't mean that. No, I didn't mean that. I meant the, I mean mm-hmm. your first idea. Oh, that, yeah, the uh, um, it's, a, it's a kind of it's a kind of refuge. Um, you know, um, Cause the life is life is often hard for the for the for the for the feminine gay man, to put it mildly. Yes. Mm. I, was, I just got caught up thinking, is there a parallel of the sneaky fucker, actually, which is oh, maybe the male lesbian, right? The, mm. the, sorry, the male lesbian. Because that is a person disguising themselves as female in order to try to get a chance of sex with a female. And if they're both reproductively male and female, that is even the evolutionary strategy. So it's just these okay. cases are really... Yeah. It's not that they do nothing for the trans activist cause, it's just they don't quite do what they think it does. But they could be more creative and interesting about yeah, right. it, and there would be right. something no, that's true. to explore. Well, of course, that's the danger of it, you know, the creativity that comes into this. Because, you know, even in mammals where sex is strongly differentiated, as we know, the, 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 the pathway to either a testis or ovary, it involves really uh, growth of different aspects of the same tissue, you know cortex versus medulla of the gonadal ridge and those kinds of things. So, so there's, there, 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 there's enough room to come in and say that every mammal is, in a sense, transgender or not strongly sex determined. But again, we come back to the issue that, well, you know, when we're talking about the social issues, we're talking about humans. And yeah. humans, there's a certain reality uh, involved there. And uh, you mentioned something about the biological theory that comes into this. I mean, even back as far as Ronald Fisher in the 1930s, you know, he worked out genetic theories, population genetic theories, that that's in a sexually reproducing organism, natural selection will always push you towards exactly two sexes. And, right. uh, right. and, and so, you know, the thing that, that uh, is concerning to me as an outside observer looking in is that there seems to be this incredible fantasy world that's 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 building up around this 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 concept. A lot of confusion over this, and especially when there's political issues involved, you worry about just how creative your opponents are going to be in exploiting biological facts. You know, and, and so, um, how do we deal with that? Does reality help bring everything everyone back to? To uh, to uh, an even plane, or back to the real world, or or are we doomed to keep going into this fantasy world of however many genders there are now, however many letters there are in the LGBTQ acronym now? How do we how do we deal with that socially? I mean, one problem is how co-opted the experts have become, right? Because it would be one thing if this was just the gender studies professors trying to pretend sex was really complicated and that vindicates non-binary mm-hmm. ba- you know, bathroom change or whatever, but it's even the biologists writing their op-eds in Nature or whatever. So the I think there's a real problem from the perspective of the the average member of the public that wants to make up their mind about these things. They're being told this is the new science. Mm-hmm. Or, this is this is progressive. This is coming from experts at illustrious institutions. So I don't have a solution, but I just think that that makes the problem so much more intractable that people mm-hmm. are lending their academic expertise and credibility to spread these kind of politically ideological hmm. ideas and that that makes the problem a lot harder to solve yeah I mean another point to, to make is that 
there's really very little connection in, in the first place between these claims about biology and claims about, about social policy. I mean, if it turned out that there were actually three sexes in, in, in humans, then that wouldn't, of course, spoil, by itself, spoil the idea that, yeah, we, sex is important and we ought to take it into account. And may, maybe it would make the case even stronger. So, you know, we should now have sporting categories for the, for the three sexes. Now we've discovered that there's, uh, there's an extra one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so another, yeah, another uh, puzzling thing about the whole debate is why these biological claims, which are really peripherally connected to the social and political ones, are emphasized so much, and why mm. um, uh, views about biology um, have become so polarizing. So, you know, if you're in the sexist binary camp, then we know what your political views are as far as... Um, you know, whether you're on the gender critical side or the let's call it the trans rights activist side, you're yeah. obviously on the gender critical side. And yeah. if you say sex is a spectrum or something, or yeah. um, there are more than two sexes, or yeah. uh, if you make a big deal out of clownfish, then you're on the trans rights activist side. It's very yeah. strange. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no there's no uh, sort of logical reason why the two should go together as closely as they actually do go together. It's also strange because for the feminist, even if it turned out that humans could change sex in the manner of a clownfish, they don't care about your sex as an adult at a time. The only reason they care about sex is because that's the stratification from birth into classes or castes. Mm -hmm. So they care about boys being raised into masculinity and masculine norms and girls mm -hmm. being raised into femininity mm -hmm. and female expectations. Yeah. They don't want the man in the changing room because he's been socialized to sexually objectify their bodies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a behavioral thing. Yeah. If he was secretly female, but wrongly assigned male and then raised male, they're gonna have the same problem with him. Yeah. So yeah. it's like the sex stuff really is kind of beside the point, except in this like initial segregation into two types of yeah. person. Yeah. So yeah, there's a yeah. lot of confusion and talking yeah. past, I think, in what the biology can do, even if they win all their strange claims. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, I think you made the point, Alex, that we can't really differentiate between are we socializing males into masculine roles, or is it the masculine nature of children that is actually shaping society so that these kinds of behavioral things are essentially a consequence of the biology, the biological reality that we're dealing with, right? And uh, well, he, here, here, Holly and I have some uh, some <laughs> fruitful uh, disagreement. I'm much more on the on the biological side mm -hmm. that the let's say the distinctive play play styles of mm -hmm. boys and girls have, uh, um, is strongly influenced by biology, in particular the prenatal hormonal environment. Uh, Holly tends to be more skeptical about that. But could I just pick you up on one thing? A, a, about the uh, about the biology. I mean, forget mm -hmm. about psychology. When it comes to um, male violence against uh, women or uh, male and female sporting categories, um, their biology does seem to be um, pretty relevant, uh, uh, right? So, so in the in the debate over whether trans women can participate in, in female sports, um, people who think they should tend, to, of course, to downplay the biological differences between males and females and say, well, there's, yeah, there's really no, it's just like, you know, males are um, fed more Wheaties when they were boys or something, that explains why, the, um, why, why men are bigger, stronger, and faster than, uh, than women. And those who think that transgender women should be excluded from, from female sports tend to play up the play up the biological differences and say, yeah, well, it's because of this um, largely because of this burst of um, testosterone that uh, males have during puberty. That's what makes them um, faster, bigger, stronger than, than women. 
So yeah, the biology is relevant to that. It is, but I think it's, it's relevant in very different ways in the sport and the violence case. I think the sport case, I think most feminists would agree with you, the sort of evolved physiological differences between the sexes give an unfair, well, don't call it unfair, but make, make a difference that makes a difference for fair competition or likely outcomes. The violence thing is more complicated, right? Because that's not... There's a capacity there. There's a strength differential. Men can, yeah. on average, punch harder. Right. But then with violence, there's all this much more complicated stuff about under what conditions are men more likely to feel free to perpetrate that violence. And you get really different societies where they do and don't. Um, and we police things more or less. And we, yeah, we give boys better and worse strategies for coping with their emotions or whatever. So, I mean, what does that show about the, um, the contribution of the biology to the difference? Certainly there's something and there's something that we all have to talk about, but yeah, I do think that the, the sports case is much more straightforward than the, than the violence case. Yeah. So you guys disagree over, over that then? So, so would you be a, a, a culture first, biology second uh, uh, perspective on this? Uh, I, I'm certainly not close-minded yeah. um, about the influence of... I, th I think we should take our evolutionary history seriously. Yeah. I think it's... Um, I think the more plausible mechanisms and explanations I've seen apply to the species, mm -hmm. not to the sexes mm -hmm. differentially. Um, I'm very skeptical about evolutionary psychology. Anything that has a sex differentiated strong psychological explanation, mm -hmm. I just think there's too much else that can plausibly explain it and I often think we don't need it. If you've got all that baked into what human society is like, you don't need female brains. <laughs> you just don't need it, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I find that quite persuasive, but I'm still learning. Like I haven't read a ton of... I've just started teaching on this topic, so I'm still early in my... Like maybe once I've read three or four more books, then I get it more. Yeah. And I recently had a conversation with this poor guy, Phil Mind person, where I was really trying to figure out, I think I'm a folk dualist, and that's a stupid view. So I was like, I don't really believe that the, the, mind, that the mind just follows from the brain, and mm. then that's why I'm reluctant yeah. to believe in from birth sexed brain differences. So maybe once I figure out my... Film mind <laughs> stuff better, I'll be less reluctant to believe in some of these theories. So I'm just, I've still got quite a bit of like work and thinking to do to really get to a point where I can thump the table about my position. But from now, I think Alex is more sympathetic to evolutionary psychology mm -hmm. than I am. And I tend to go for a like, no, most of this is culture and learning and human institutions. It's not baked into the, the biology. Yeah. Of course, that is the, that is the, the second wave tradition. It's not as if yeah. this has come from... No, I didn't make it up. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you made it up. Yeah, they, uh, many second wave feminists of the 1970s, actually, I guess, Simone de Beauvoir is another example. Yeah. Much earlier um, feminist. Um, the, the second sex came out in... When, was that? 1949. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the idea was that, okay, men are... Men are bigger and stronger, and, mm -hmm. but that's it. Yeah. yeah. Everything else, all, all other di uh, differences yeah. are socially imposed. Or, yeah. yeah. And maybe one um, thing even earlier, right? People like John Stuart Mill, they were just saying, we don't have enough, oh, yeah, we right. don't have enough information mm -hmm. yet. Like, no, that's right. give women a chance. Don't throw your strong evolution, evolutionary psychology theories at them saying that they've evolved to be the mothers, yeah. like just leave them alone and give them all the opportunities. And then once we've got enough information, yeah. let's see how things shake out. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting point too, right? It's not saying we know, it's just saying let's be agnostic until we've really given things a chance. Maybe we'll see more equality than we expected once we believe in it, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So I think that's interesting too. Yeah, since we're on the topic of evolution, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a similar kind of a there's a similar kind of confusion that goes on in evolutionary biology, and uh, the, um, the most obvious manifestation of that is that is is the confusion over the concept of the species among evolutionary biologists who should 
you know, have a pretty good idea of what's going on. I mean, there are dozens of different conceptions of the species that uh, biologists work from, and no one can really settle on which one is the right one. And, and uh, of course, the parallel with this is, you know, you've spoken about the, the tremendous proliferation about, uh, of different kinds of uh, gender identities, the confusion over what it means uh, to be male versus female versus man or, or woman. And, and one of the sources of confusion in evolutionary biology is, is an almost overly determinist way of thinking about uh, uh, the behavior of species, natural selection, um, uh, the psychology of, of species, that you have this biological reality which then determines the social reality. All right? and, and again, I'm, I'm bringing in a lot of different things here, but there's a similar kind of confusion that goes on over artificial intelligence. You know, uh, there, there's this computational school of artificial intelligence, but then you have uh, people like Barry Smith, for example, who say that, well, well no, that's, that's nothing like what goes on in real brains, you know, so you will never have an artificial general intelligence that is based upon computation. And when it comes to socialization, you know, uh, it's not just one or the other. It's, it, 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 it can't just be that biology determines behavior and interaction or biology or behavior is a blank slate. Every living thing is sort of is on a continual negotiation with its environment about how to fit into that environment. And surely there's some of that that goes on in transgender things. I think we've seen that there's this social aspect of of transgenderism, especially as Abigail Schreier has argued that, that well, you know, if you look at the incidence of, of, of adolescent girls claiming that they're trans, there seems to be a very clear social component to it. And, and um, you know, so, so maybe we're thinking about the, the whole sex transgender issue with similar confusion. I mean, maybe we actually don't really, we're not thinking about it in the correct way. You know, we're not thinking about it as this continual negotiation of individuals with their society and with their... Uh, right, with right. Their of course, the funny thing is that um, even though there's this very strong feminist, blank slatist tradition, so all you know, behavioral differences between the sexes uh, are due to socialization, when it comes to the transgender issue, um, lots of people who think of themselves as progressive um, feminists um, are, are very much opposed to the idea that the recent rapid rise in um, trans identification among uh, adolescent uh, girls is due, has, has a social component uh, at all. Uh, so they're very much against the, the notion this is the physician Lisa Littner's term, the notion of rapid onset uh, gender dysphoria, which really does seem to be a new, uh, a new presentation of gender dysphoria, distress at one's sexed body, um, before the, the classic early onset presentation um, w was apparent quite early in, in childhood, before puberty, and mostly affected, mostly affected So I, it, there's a strong impetus towards. I, I mean, I think you can maybe see the same thing um, uh, as far as as far as gay rights go. So you know, people in favour of gay rights tended to like seize on the um, the born that way narrative as a way of sort of making it more palatable, um, and you, you see the same thing. In transgender case. It's true and I've had Oof. people be very creative about their like they work really hard to come up with explanations for how it could still be innate born this way and compatible with the complete change in the epidemiology mm, so right. the young female so someone and a very smart person who I like a lot suggested to me a, in a um, audience session to a talk oh maybe it's that a, the one we always hear, greater acceptance leads to greater numbers, but B, because of anti-feminist history, 
women have been less likely to come forward about their stuff. So now that we have feminism and greater acceptance, we should right. expect to see the numbers shift. So maybe the true prevalence of trans all along was more adolescent females than middle-aged men. But because we have these masking mm. features of patriarchy and stigma around being trans. So I thought that was really, like, I don't buy that for a second, but I mm. really admired her, how she was putting her philosophical brain <laughs> to the task of, like, yeah. trans activism, right? She's yeah. got that commitment. And that is an interesting, we should consider that possible explanation. Yeah. I don't think it takes us all the way, but, like, yeah. it's kind of intriguing in some sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you come to gender dysphoria, though, you know it, it's it's uh, it has a lot of resemblances to other types of body dysmorphia, like men thinking that they're too skinny and they need to have more muscle bulk, or women thinking that they're too big and they have to exactly. have to cut down. And and to what extent have 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 we explored the issue that gender dysphoria is just one of many types of body dysphorias that are out there and what's causing it you know I've, I've, I've read some things about body dysphoria for example that's tied in with uh, high levels of anxiety there are certain aspects of obsessive compulsive disorder involved in that sort of thing to what extent has 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 that issue been explored in the whole debate over transgenderism that is as just another form of body dysmorphia or some something special, something special beyond obviously the focus on on sex versus being too big or too too uh, too skinny or things like that. Is there any are, are, is there any aspect of the discussion about that? There is. So I reviewed for I looked into for a while this innateness question for gender identity or trans mm -hmm. identification and what the um, sort of neuroscience, et cetera, liter literature was saying about that. There's hardly anything, so it's mostly splitting into the familiar prenatal mm. hormones, twin studies. What's the other one? I'm now blanking. There's three types anyway. Um, okay, don't worry, there's mm -hmm. a third. But there was this one interesting, like I think only two studies on it, looking at regions of the brain responsible for body image. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, was like a newish and promising-ish way of thinking about where gender dysphoria is coming from, that it's a kind of dissonance in your seeing how you look at yourself. And I think that fits in with your idea about mm -hmm. what if this is just part of a, a cluster of things mm -hmm. that are more to do with your being off about your own appearance or obsessing about certain aspects of your appearance. But I think, as Alex says, because there's this focus on thinking of this as somehow parallel being trans is somehow parallel to being gay, there's a reluctance to even open up those questions about mm. what else might be going on. Mm. Um, do you want to say something about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it certainly has been noticed that the, 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 new, um, the new population appearing at clinics of children and uh, adolescents with, with gender dysphoria is quite, quite different from the... Uh, the previous population it's one it, it's much bigger for one thing but also lots of these kids have other um, co comorbid conditions like autism or anxiety or, mm. or uh, depression yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean I should say that in the maybe in the case of um, in the case of being gay you know whether whether it's a matter of being born this way or, or not, um, I would have thought that shouldn't really matter at all to whether you know, we have gay marriage or gay mm. rights or, or whatever. So that seems to be quite, quite different. Um, sorry, I mean, that, seems that, that, that issue, whether gay people are born this way, whether sexual orientation is, is innate, doesn't really seem to be particularly relevant to, to the issue of Unless it's wrong. Okay, right. right. What? Unless it's wrong. I mean, Christian morality says it's oh, wrong. Oh, yeah, right. And well, if you and, and if you can't help it, then you're off the hook morally. So I think they, that's why they plug it in, right, to, to destigmatize it at the first step. Yeah. And then later when you think, oh, it's not wrong, you can even if you just chose it, that's fine. Same with trans. I think we are seeing that with trans now. People like Angie Long too, right? Now yeah, it's no, just a freedom right. thing. Now we could just choose it now that it's destigmatized. 
but mm. that's the point initially, right? That it's like, yeah, it's wrong, but I can't help it. Right, <laughs> right. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. Mm. To right. No, no, no. Um, yeah. But in the in the in the case of um, of people with with gender d dysphoria, I think there's. Um, I think the the emphasis on um, gender identity being uh, being innate and there's no social uh, component to this is very useful to people who want uh, medical transition to be to be widely available because if it's innate and biological then well probably yeah. no amount of mm -hmm. no amount of therapy will help and the only solution is to, to change the body to match the innate mind. Yeah. But then interesting how much reluctance there has been to go for that treatment in the limb cases, right? So yeah. in other cases of dysphoria, yeah. dysmorphia, I guess right. what you call that, right. 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 where yeah. people don't feel ownership of that limb, it's hugely controversial yeah. among the medical professionals yeah. whether the right thing to do is to alter the body. But it's not as controversial in transgender medicine. So there is some interesting right. Right. dissonance there if you're thinking about it in terms of these body issues rather than this kind of yeah. parallel to sexual orientation. Yeah. And, and you would never recommend gastric bypass surgery to an anorexic, for example. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. that would be insane. But for some reason, uh, as you say, you know, we seem to be very eager as a society to channel children, especially, into these kinds of life-altering surgical manipulations. And again, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that you would do that, especially for children, you know? Yeah. And this, uh, this issue of your body image, everyone has a body image, and, and I think everyone goes through periods where you're not quite satisfied with your body, you know? And, and this is part of the ongoing negotiation of, of an intellect, if you will, to with its environment and these things change and so why on earth would we encourage children to be doing this because I think the statistics have shown that that most of these children who are gender confused well most children go through a period where they're a bit gender confused confused about what they are and they normally grow out of it yet we seem overly eager as a society to channel children into this life-altering thing again based upon the fact that Oh, this is a deterministic thing. It's innate. You can't change it. I'm not quite so sure about that. Right. Uh, so the uh, something called the CAS review just came out yeah. uh, last mm -hmm. last week in in the UK. This was um, a very lengthy, almost 400 page review of um, pediatric um, gender medicine conducted by a very respected pediatrician, mm -hmm. Hilary Cass. And uh, to no one's great surprise, the, the conclusion was that these medical treatments for children and adolescents, puberty blockers and, and cross-sex hormones have almost no evidence backing them up. So that is essentially the end of gender-affirming care in the, in the UK, I think. Um, and a number of other U European countries are similarly mm -hmm backing off and being very cautious and that leaves the US as, and also to some extent Australia, Australia yeah. as, mm -hmm. uh, as a really big outlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. hmm. So it would be interesting to see how, uh, what uh, effect the, the CAS review has, uh, has over here. Yeah. Um, certainly WPATH, the World Professional Association for Tran Transgender Health, yeah. has already issued a statement denouncing the cash report or yeah. saying yeah. that's all. But, you know, it's... I mean, one, th the, yeah. mm -hmm. one thing that's in the cash report, which review, I think will... Sorry, um, review, sorry, review. Which yeah. will help is the, the sort of addressing of the suicide narrative, because I think what you were saying earlier about why are people so eager to do this mm -hmm. thing with children, it's because it's weaponized that they're always waving this possibility of child suicide in front of the parent's yeah. face or society's yeah. face. And if your choice is to do this really risky thing with bad effects or have the death of a child on your hands, of mm -hmm. course that's a sufficient harm that you might yeah. go in for the treatment. Yeah. So I think now that that has been at a very reputable source, 
kind of addressed and debunked. I mean, there's still higher suicidality, if I remember correctly, but, right. but very low yeah. absolute suicide. And I think the at least this kind of constant myth that like the trans child will kill themselves if not transitioned, that is no longer tenable. And so that might also help things in countries like the US and Australia. I might be being optimistic, but, but that would be my hope. Yeah, I think you're being, well, from my <laughs> perspective, you're being a bit too optimistic because, you know, as you, as you mentioned earlier, uh, and, and this is dismaying to me as well, the, the uh, eagerness with which biologists uh, uh, dive into this narrative in support of this and this in support of this particular ideology and and this is part of a I think a broader phenomenon of the politicization of science in 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 general and mm -hmm. and so whether the CAS report gets anywhere in the US is going to turn crucially on these political issues and the right. professionals who are quite eager to to ignore evidence quite honestly in favor of advancing a particular political agenda and and the curious thing to me about the transgender uh, controversy is 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 how easily it, it 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 trips into a departure from reality a departure from uh, uh, respect for empirical analysis and the humility that should go along with that um, and uh, I think Helen Pluckrose has has marked it as almost a slide into a totalitarian way of approaching things, and so, to what extent do you think that uh, this is part of a bigger uh, trend in the politicization of science in general, and what's causing that? What are your perspectives on that? Yeah, that is, that is an excellent question. I wish I had some uh, some good answer because science. I mean, these things come in 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 ways, of course, and there yeah. were all these controversies around sociobiology in the yeah. in the nineteen seventies. So it's not exactly as if this is completely new, but we we do seem to be on the crest of some wave of the politicization of of science at the moment. Um, I mean, COVID is a, is, is a good example. And I think the politicization seems to be particularly bad in the, in the United States for some reason, much, yeah. wor much worse than it is in Britain or yeah. pro probably, yeah. Austra probably mm -hmm. Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's also connected to another topical issue uh, free speech and and academic freedom, and certainly in the in the academy, I, things have not been very healthy as far as the climate for academic freedom goes yeah. over over sex and gender issues, as, yeah. as Holly in mm -hmm. in particular knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we certainly went through a bad patch in the last few years. And it's actually been quite amazing, like at my university. They're now all about how to have difficult conversations. And as soon as Israel-Palestine hit, and in my sense, as soon as that, I'm going to sound like a feminist, as soon as there were male academics on both <laughs> sides, that's what it looks like to me. Maybe I'm wrong. But it's like there were these things for the last six years that were extremely ugly, but they were women involved in them. Yeah. On both sides, it was the gender studies feminists yeah. and the me. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't care, and they never took any steps to, like, de-escalate things put on a healthy conversation find a way to like nothing and in a way i feel i mean i didn't get fired but short yeah. of that they were terrible yeah i think but yeah. now it's like oh we're bringing in this educator from the uk to help people learn how to facilitate difficult conversations in the classroom mm. it's like suddenly mm. well they're sending out regular emails about the student protesters and their behavior yeah. apparently recently some students have been coming asking for a show of hands of agreement and then taking photos <laughs> bullying the students into having certain views or pretending to yeah. and now they're doing something about it mm -hmm. where were they <laughs> like, yeah. so yeah it's interesting that i mean in a way that's positive right because it suggests that there is an issue a serious issue a war that can get people to can get the academy to start taking this seriously yeah. but in another sense i'm like yeah too little too late right? <laughs> like i'm i'm still mad um, <laughs> yeah. yeah although I, I, 
I mean, there, as you were alluding to, there is this significant um, sex difference in you know, su support for for free speech and and, and free expression. I mean, so what's the I don't know. Well, men are much more, more likely more to likely. support free speech than, than women. It's, so it, what is it that? turns out. Well, you're just too kind. Is that I'm wondering? <laughs> is it like more sensitive about the alleged harms of the speech? Yeah, I, mean, yeah, um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I guess because campuses are so um, left biased anyway, if women are tending to go along more with the in group for socialized reasons, not biological mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that about yeah. free, free speech yeah. support. But that's, that makes it less surprising why every time I show up to a free speech event, it's mostly young women. Yeah, young no, that's men. right. <laughs> or in last night's case, slightly older men. <laughs> well, tonight should be an interesting exercise in uh, free speech, and uh, I wish both of you uh, luck. Uh, I want to come back to your final thoughts on this, but uh, I just need to put in a plug for the NAS. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, this has been sponsored by the National Association of Scholars. Uh, if you, uh, you have enjoyed it, uh, thanks for your support. And if you enjoyed it and you're not a member, please do consider uh, becoming a member. And so tonight's uh, debate on the question, uh, is sex binary? Uh, we're looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun, and I'll leave any final thoughts to the two of you. Well, thanks very much, Scott. I mean, I think Holly and I are both looking forward to it, and we're very pleased to be up against uh, Aaron and Alice. Mm. I'm sure will uh, will give us a good run for our money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you for appearing on our webinar, and I look forward to tonight's debate. Thank you. Cheers.